Um, next one's going to be Tycho Anderson from Cisco, talking about forwarding Cisco's to user space. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, uh, my name is Tycho Anderson, and as Stefan said, I work for Cisco. I uh, worked for two different places recently. Um, uh, also, people usually have a picture of themselves on GitHub, but uh, my GitHub picture is like six years old and I didn't have a beard then, so it doesn't really look anything like me, so I didn't think that would be any, very useful. Anyway, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, a little uh, kernel patch set um, that I worked on recently called, that basically enables you to forward syscalls to user space. So what, is, what does that mean? So the, for, to, for motivation, uh, if I do an unshare um, and I'm in a user namespace uh, and I try and do a make node, I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, and if, for those of you who are familiar, uh, one and three are the device major minor for dev null. Um, and that seems sort of unreasonable because dev null is a fairly harmless Linux device um, which just sends EOF. And if you look in the kernel code somewhere, there's this check basically which is this. And the important part is this capable bit. Um, so there are devices like dev kmem or dev mem which are, uh, you would not necessarily want to let a container have access to because then people can do uh, bad things. But um, in you know, the dev null, dev zero, these kind of innocuous devices, it might be nice to relax this restriction a little bit. So one option would be to hard code a list of acceptable devices in, uh, in the kernel, in the VFS make node layer, and then move on with our lives. Um, but then every time somebody adds a new device, and you have to argue with the maintainer of that device about is this okay or not, yada yada. Um, so another uh, another problem is you can't mount certain file systems. So the uh, Ubuntu kernel actually has some patches that are out three patches that there's a sysctl where you can enable mounting of uh, x4. There's a flag um, you get fs underscore user and s underscore something else. I forget what it is in the kernel that indicates whether or not a user can mount a file system. Um, but the reason these restrictions exist are mostly because, uh, you know, the file system parsers aren't safe or, you know, whatever. Um, and, the, you know, some of the maintainers, like the like Ted Sub X4 maintainer, has said, hey, I'll fix uh, weird file system parser bugs that cause exploits. Um, so some of the file systems might be safe. Um, so maybe that's something you'd be interested in doing. Uh, and basically, it sort of has the same check here. Uh, you must be root uh, and have the Capsys admin capability to do that. Um, so what if we could instead do something like this? And uh, the P network's bad, so I had lax animation, but we'll just use a PDF so that it doesn't die. So anyway, um, if I start in the container, and the container runs a mount syscall, um, you know, that would go into the kernel through the, you know, regular entry path and then do some magic function and then forward that to the host which could then set an S to the container's namespace, do the mount assuming it approved things and then lie to the container and say, hey, your mount call succeeded. It didn't really run the kick mount call in the context of the container, but we did it for them, we lied to them uh, and it all worked out. So you can imagine doing this with mount or with make node um, or uh, loading kernel modules. So <laughs> ordinarily, you would not want to uh, let a container run uh, load a kernel module because then all of a sudden they're running code in the kernel. Uh, but there is this thing where it's actually maybe reasonable to to look at the module blob that the container is asking you to load, and then load the host version uh, because in particular the kernel or the, the the host is running may be different than the kernel that the container was running. So if you, even if it wasn't malicious, it still might be incorrect. Uh, you, you, know, you wouldn't be able to load that module. But if you're you know, uh, trying to load the IP tables module or whatever, as long as you load the host module and it exposes all the APIs that the IP tables thing exposes, uh, then it should work just fine. So this is a way that you could allow kernel uh, or containers to load kernel modules you know, assuming that you had a safe version that you actually trusted that was on the host. Um, so this is like another application of this. You can imagine there's a whole bunch of these. 
um, where it would just kind of be nice to have uh, an implementation of this magic function here. Um, so how do we implement magic? Uh, so the easiest way uh, is with ptrace. And this, you can do this today. And in fact, if you look at the checkpoint restore tool, the live migration tool for containers, they do a lot of this stuff. But actually, GDB and every other thing, they do this, this stepping where you attach to some task, you step through syscall by syscall, you look at uh, you know, whatever the arguments are, you process them however you want. Of course, the problem with this is you have to stop on every syscall. And uh, so that gets slow, and most of the syscalls you don't care about, you maybe only care about mount and an init module, which are fairly uncommon, and the rest of the thing you want to just run um, you know, forever. Uh, so there's a second way, actually, still using ptrace, where you can use seccom. Um, and basically, this is like code for, this is like the assembly code version of VPF. Um, but the important part here is the seccom ret trace. Basically, what this says is, if you see a mount syscall, trigger a ptrace event. And so then you can ptrace attached to a task, and it runs along normally, not stopping at every syscall. But then when the seccom program says, hey, uh, something happened, then it triggers a ptrace event, and you can be listening for that. So this is a lot faster because you don't have to stop on every syscall and make sure it's the one you're looking for. Um, but it still means that you have to ptrace the track task. And so um, if I'm a container runtime and I'm trying to implement this line to containers about what their syscalls are returning, that means I have to ptrace them. So then when you, the user uh, comes along and wants to debug that, what do they do? If they want to debug, well, they use the Feynman algorithm, which is write down the hard problem, think really hard, and then write down the solution. Uh, and that's not really ideal. Um, what you'd like to be able to do is use strace and, and GDB and all these other tools that you're familiar with. Uh, so what we'd really like to do is implement something that doesn't involve ptrace. Uh, and so that's basically what this set does. Um, so we have, instead of doing a set comp right trace, we can sort of introduce uh, yet another uh, set comp return code, which is return user notification. And that basically would trigger this, this magic to happen. Um, and then the how you would interact with that as a... Um, as a programmer who's on the other side of that is, uh, it's basically, at least in the implementation that I posted, it's just a file descriptor. And so you have two things. You have a, a notification, the kernel sends you this structure. You have an ID, which is like a little, just a cookie. Um, the process ID of the uh, task that did this, and then the set comp data. And if you look at this, it's the same structure you get, um, you know, if, uh, for like uh, your EBPF program that you have, or your BPF program here, this struct setcom data, you get basically the same data. And this is important because um, this setcom data structure does not expose stuff like uh, actual memory of the process. So for example, for the mount system call, you actually pass it uh, the name of the file system and the source and target locations that you want to mount at. You pass those as pointers. And uh, so in the kernel, the way syscalls are implemented, they're not atomic. So for, so for example, if the setcom policy runs first thing right after entry, it, sh it, it might read some pointers, uh, check the memory, say, OK, this mount seems reasonable. We're just not here or there. Those are both not important paths. Uh, and then you know, it, it says, OK, go ahead and do the syscall. But then when the VFS layer actually reads this, if you change that value via another thread or somehow, with shared memory or something, then the syscom filter already said it was OK, but now you've changed it to something nefarious, so there's a time of check, time of use uh, problem here. Um, and so that's why setcom traditionally does not expose uh, the, the, the task memory uh, to programs. Um, and so you might think, OK, well, don't you have the same problem here? And the answer is yes. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful about uh, how you do this. Um, so the, 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 the magic trick is there, if the task has some shared memory with another thread or something and it's, uh, that, that can mutate its address space, um, it can change the, the memory for that task. But if you, as the tracer or the person who's doing the, um, the mounting or whatever on behalf of this task, if you copy all of the relevant memory out 
and then inspect it all on, on your side, um, then it's, a, it's an atomic thing because they can only edit their memory, they can't edit your memory. So whatever, you, whatever the initial value of the syscall is, that's what they're going, to, they're going to show you. And then you can apply your policy and say, yes, this is an okay mount, or no, this is not an okay mount. So with a little bit of cleverness, you can actually work around this other um, time of check, time of use issue, which SetComp has. Um, so anyway, that's what the notification looks like. Uh, so you basically, um, you know, you, you read from that, uh, on here on the right side, you read from that, then you do whatever the stuff you're going to do is, and then you respond, um, and you can respond with an error code, um, you know, and uh, you respond, and that's all well and good. Um, as you might imagine, uh, do stuff is slightly complex, so there's the time of check, time of use uh, issue um, that I just mentioned. There's also this problem about actually accessing the memory is just itself a complicated, somewhat complicated problem. You basically, uh, Slack Proc has these um, files called map files where you can open some other task memory and, to, and map that and then read whatever addresses you want. Um, or you could, if you really like pain, you can use ptrace peak and poke user. Um, but those are not super awesome to use. Uh, and then there's actually a third problem, which I sort of haven't discussed. If you're doing this with, you know, I'm going to fake opening netlink sockets for you or something, you can, you can imagine doing all sorts of crazy stuff with this. Um, but in that case, the system call actually returns a file descriptor. And you need to inject them that file descriptor back into the task static space. Because, you know, if you open a file descriptor here, it's got to go there somehow. And so um, there's a number of ways to do that. Basically, using ptrace, you inject some code that then does a receive message on some file descriptor or something. Um, you could inject the code that just opens the file descriptor from somebody else's slash proc if it's actually viewable. Um, or a potential extension to this set is we could add a way to do this very nicely from the response structure, which may or may not be interesting. We'll see. Um, uh, how, how this whole discussion goes in the first place. Uh, <laughs> um, so then there, there's a question of how do you get a hold of one of these things? So I told you you read and write with a file descriptor. So this is also sort of an open question if you have an API design that you think is cool, come talk to me. Uh, right now I have sort of two different ways to do it. The first one is um, you install the setcom filters you normally would with the setcom syscall, but you can pass this additional flag, and then um, you get the FD back, and then you can send message that FD to some server or whoever, and then that server will subsequently rewrite, pull, do whatever. Uh, of course, the problem with that is if your setcom policy blocks send message, uh, then you can't do anything. Um, so that's not really ideal. Uh, another way would be to use ptrace again, but uh, you could then you can attach to a task and get a listener for one of its um, set count programs, and then you don't have you don't have to send messages, you don't have any of this weirdness. But you do have to use ptrace to do that. So some people don't like ptrace. Um, so I think if you have another API design that sounds cool, I'm happy. To, this isn't really that hard to implement. Um, uh, so. Uh, yeah, uh, there's some implementation issues, uh, synchronization across tasks, because you're passing these messages back and forth between tasks. This is somewhat challenging. Uh, it took me a while of sitting and thinking to figure out how to do it. I think it's right, but, uh, but uh, maybe it's not, so come tell me I'm wrong. Um, there's another issue about synchronization with an expired ID that's sort of a detail um, status. There's GitHub. We discussed it at Linux Plumbers, which is sort of the genesis for this idea. Uh, and then it sort of sat on the shelf for six months, and so that's why I implemented it. Um, I posted V1. Uh, those of you who are very astute will notice that that URL is today. I posted it this morning. So there's not a lot of discussion there yet. Join in. You could, uh, you could tell me I'm wrong. Uh, I was going to do a demo, but I only have five minutes. So um, I'll do this. I'm a polite person. So, uh oh, they just do. Yeah. 
I think my SSH session in my VM died, or the VM itself died. Uh, Four fifteen kernel for me on this VM. This machine is not that super awesome. Uh, so anyway, screw the demo. Uh, I wasn't really going to do it anyway. Uh, do anything cool? Thanks. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you.